Good evening, everyone. Um, after diving all of the wrecks in bikini this week with all the, the choice of wrecks, it seems odd to focus just on one wreck, a destination where you go to where there is just the one wreck. Um, but I think the Britannic is definitely worth it. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, HMHS, Her Majesty's Hospital Ship Britannic, which I've also called Titanic's prettier sister. The name uh, comes from the fact that a uh, there was a, a documentary done by Andy Talbot uh, just before we did this trip, and he called the Britannic the tragic sister. Um, actually, there were less lives lost on the, uh, the Britannic than on the Titanic. Um, and as you'll see as we go through, it, there, it could have been that there were no lives lost. Um, so the other reason why I, um, I prefer the name the prettier sister is you can see down here in this picture all the coral. Um, unlike the Titanic, which is really collapsing and has been damaged quite um, heavily by marine growth, the marine growth on the Britannic is protecting it. It's acting like an exoskeleton around the, the wreck, hence the, uh, the prettier sister. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, the Britannic was the sister ship of the Titanic. There were three in total, the Olympic, the Britannic, and the, uh, the Titanic. Uh, now, for anyone that um, hasn't seen the movie Titanic, a little bit of a spoiler alert, but it sinks uh, in the end. Um, and um, the Britannic was designed to avoid some of the downfalls that the, the Titanic had. So there were some changes made. It was still being built when the Titanic sank. So they put a, a double hull around the majority of the... Uh, of the ship around the, the boiler room and the engine area. Um, the bulkheads were raised, the watertight bulkheads were raised up to the B deck. Um, and uh, the Titanic was supposed to be able to withstand four flooded compartments. The Britannic was uprated, upgraded and it was supposed to be able to survive six flooded uh, compartments. In addition, they carried enough life rafts for everybody on board, not just the, the first class uh, passengers. So um, the idea was to try and learn the lessons from the Titanic and make sure that the Britannic really was unsinkable. And the fact that we're talking about a wreck um, means that actually they didn't really succeed. So we'll go through why that all of those precautions failed um, as we go through the, uh, the talk. The other change that was intended with the Britannic is that it was meant to be even more luxurious uh, than the Titanic. So the staterooms, the decorations, everything was meant to be more luxurious than the, uh, the Titanic. Um, and the level of uh, craftsmanship on the fittings was, uh, uh, was, was amazing. Actually, a lot of the fittings weren't put in place. Uh, the, Titanic was requisitioned by the Admiralty in 1915 before it had been completed. And so it wasn't completed as a luxury liner. Um, in fact, a lot of the fittings that were supposed to go into the Britannic were sold on. It's possible to still buy items of furniture that were meant to go on the Britannic. There's a, a hotel in uh, Northumberland in the northeast uh, of, the, of the UK, which is largely decorated with furniture that was supposed to go on the on the Britannic. So rather than acting as a luxury liner, it actually spent its entire working life as a, a hospital ship because 1915 was in the middle of the, the First World War and its first journey was in December 2000, uh, sorry, December 1915 um, and its entire working life was involved with the Gallipoli campaign. So you've got Greece here, uh, Turkey here, and these are the Dardanelles Straits and the Gallipoli Peninsula. And there was a huge battle to try and take that peninsula and huge numbers of uh, casualties were generated. So the Britannic would sail um, through, the, uh, through the Mediterranean, up the Kia Channel between Athens and the island of Kia, and then on to Mudros and then Lemnos, which was the forward operating base for the, the Gallipoli campaign. <clears throat> so it did uh, six journeys altogether, or five and a half, uh, shall we say. So on the 21st of November, 
it was on its way towards um, Lemnos to pick up casualties on its, uh, its sixth journey. Very fortunate, really, that it, it hit, that it, uh, it sank on the way out. Uh, it only had a skeleton crew of um, sailors and medical staff on board, no casualties. If it had been coming back the other way, it would have been a much more serious situation because it would have been packed with, uh, with casualties. Um, but it was a uh, you know, fairly relaxed morning. Um, the, the crew and the medical uh, staff had just finished breakfast, and at 8.12, an explosion was heard. And despite all the precautions that had been taken to make it even more unsinkable than the, the Titanic, um, it started listing and sinking fairly quickly. Uh, the captain tried to save the ship. He, he was fairly close to the island of Kia, so he turned and tried to drive uh, ashore and, and beach the ship to try and uh, save it. And this is where the, the tragic bit comes in. It was a, a sunny Mediterranean uh, day. It was in November, but it was uh, you know, good weather, calm weather. They were about a mile offshore from uh, an inhabited island. Uh, so, and, and the captain thought he might be able to get the, the ship ashore. So there was absolutely no reason for anyone to die. But um, some uh, of, the, uh, of the crew panicked and started launching lifeboats. So there were two lifeboats were launched while the, and the, the captain wasn't aware of this he hadn't ordered the abandoned ship so he wasn't aware of this he was still trying to get the ship onto the shore so the uh, the lifeboats were launched and as you can see there it started to sink uh, by the bow and you've got the propellers here starting to come out of the water um, as the boat is going forward the two lifeboats were sucked back into the propellers and the only reason anyone died on the uh, uh, on the Britannic is because they were sucked into the propellers and chopped up um, and died in the lifeboats. Um, everybody that stayed on the boat was saved. Um, so it was, only the, uh, it was only a mistake that caused any fatalities. So, as I said, um, the Britannic was sailing up here between the mainland. So this is Athens, the capital of Greece. And this is the island of Kia here. So this is the area where we're talking about. So this is the, the marine chart. And you can see um, that it's fairly deep around here, 300 meters, 200, 100. Uh, so it's about 100 uh, in this area here uh, off Kia. Um, so it could have sunk in considerably deeper water, but it sank in about 120 meters. In fact, you can see the mark for the, the wreck on the chart there. If I zoom in, this is uh, the wreck mark for the, for the Britannic. So you can see um, around about 120 meters in the area around it, but 84 meters minimum depth over the wreck. So it stands up a long way. And you can see it's you know, literally just offshore from Kia Harbor. Now, at the time, there was a lot of controversy about why it was sunk. Uh, some of the eyewitnesses reported seeing a torpedo. Um, in fact, uh, a couple of uh, witnesses both reported seeing a torpedo uh, coming through the water and hitting the, uh, the ship. Unfortunately, one of them saw it at the bow, one of them saw it at the stern. So either there were two uh, submarines that simultaneously torpedoed it, which is pretty unlikely, or one put a torpedo in the bow and then very quickly came around and put one in the, in the stern, which is equally unlikely. In addition, the, the Germans kept very meticulous records of all the submarine patrols, and there was no German U-boat uh, in the area at the time. Um, however, there was a U-boat in the area about a week earlier, laying a minefield. So this is uh, an actual copy of the, the log of that, um, uh, that U-boat, U-73. And on the 21st of October, which was um, about a week or so, week 10 days before the, uh, the sinking, it laid a minefield in this area here. And if you think back to the map we just saw, here's the harbour and the Britannic is, is right there. Okay. Um, if there's any more doubt, uh, one of the expert 
expeditions in the early 2000s actually found the, the base plates of the, uh, uh, of the mine still in place. Um, the other bit of evidence is that there's another wreck, the Berdigalia, which is about 200 meters away from the Britannic, and that was sunk in the same minefield. So it's yeah, absolutely incontrovertible that uh, the Britannic's uh, sunk by hitting a, a mine. Um, in uh, 2016, and sorry, in 1916. So 2016 was the 100th year anniversary of the sinking of the, the Britannic. And the group that uh, I was involved with, we'd been trying to dive the Britannic for about five years. Uh, it was very difficult to get permission. Uh, there was a fatality on the Britannic in 2009 and the, the Greek government was very reluctant to grant permission to, uh, to groups to, to dive the, the Britannic. But we knew this conference was coming up, 100th year uh, anniversary, and everybody who's anyone uh, related to the Britannic was there. So this is Simon Mills, who's the owner of the wreck. It's actually owned by a private individual, but access is controlled by the Greek government. Uh, that's the mayor of, uh, of Kia. Um, so we knew this big conference was going on and we thought well if if we can't dive it on the 100th year anniversary as part of this uh, event then we're never going to get uh, permission so uh, we tied our next application in with the 100th year celebration and got permission to, to dive it it meant we had to do quite a lot of uh, PR stuff and um, have dinner with the mayor and do loads of other stuff but as far as I was concerned if I managed to dive the Britannic then I, um, I was happy. Uh, incidentally, you might recognize that uh, rebreather there. It's looking a little bit cleaner and shinier than it is uh, right now, but it's the, exactly the same unit sitting on the back deck uh, at the moment. So that's how long that unit has been exploring wrecks with me. So, as I said, um, the Britannic was always one of my goals. It was my uh, bucket list uh, goal. Yeah, truck, bikini, and the Britannic were the top three that I wanted to uh, uh, wanted to dive, um, and uh, I you know I would have done literally anything to dive the the Britannic, partly because of the history of it, um, but also uh, you know in it, like many wrecks that we dive, uh, Cousteau had been there before, so it was part of the Cousteau story as well. So Cousteau originally found it in seventy six, I think it was, and then dived it in seventy seven. Um, really interesting um, bit of history is that uh, this is Sheila Mitchell, who was one of the survivors of the, the Britannic. So Cousteau tracked her down. Uh, this little old white-haired lady brought her out to the Britannic expedition and took her down on a submarine to see the, the Britannic. Okay? Now, if that sounds familiar... I think that's where James Cameron got the idea of getting Rose out on the ship and taking her down on the, uh, on the submarine. Um, you know, it's, uh, like many things, Kusta has been there before us. So yeah, 75, it, uh, he found it, 76 dived it. Um, then there was a range of uh, people that dived it. Um, it was this expedition really here, 1997, uh, Kev Gurs expedition is really what triggered my interest in the, the Britannic. Um, at that point, I was really only just starting to get into technical diving, and I saw these mainly British divers doing this dive, and I thought, I want to do that. So, you know, my, my Britannic um, experience started back in 1997. Um, but then it was really 2003 when Carl Spencer started putting together uh, expeditions to the, to the Britannic that... Um, I thought actually this is this is feasible. By that point, I was in a position where I could have uh, uh, have dived it. Um, unfortunately, Carl died on the 2009 expedition, and that really restricted the access. So, a lot of the diving on the the Britannic that was done uh, from 2009 really up until 2016 uh, was done by the U-boat Malta Group, which is uh, uh, U-boat Malta is a uh, it's a group that has a, a research um, vessel, submarines, ROVs, the whole thing. I've got some pictures I'll show you. Uh, way out of the scope of the average uh, diver. 
So this is um, some of the pictures of the uh, the two Carl's two uh, Britannic uh, expeditions, um, all wearing otter Britannic uh, suits um, there, and uh, a picture of Carl uh, just before uh, that expedition. And that's the U-boat Malta uh, uh, boat. I think that is off uh, off Kia. And you can see you've got the uh, the submarine off the back. It's uh, you know hundreds of thousand pounds a, a day to rent this thing. So they were making a a documentary about the Britannic, and that's how a couple of people managed to get on that. Richie Kohler and uh, Lee Bishop uh, managed to dive as part of that expedition. And that's the the Britannic. Uh, from the um, from the inside of one of the submarines, and uh, that's uh, I think um, Richie, and I'm not sure who else. Um, you so you got one of the ROVs here, and they had a diving bell uh, there. So um, I know Lee Bishop, who's on a couple of these expeditions. He believes this is the way to to dive the Britannic. The trouble is that that's outside the scope of most people. So our expedition, uh, our goal was to show that it could be done using normal, normal, uh, normal technical diving techniques, the same sort of things that we've been doing uh, this week. You know, um, diving as a team, uh, but using shot lines, deco trapezes, you know, normal stuff as opposed to diving bells and uh, and habitats. Um, so it really was an international uh, team. So we've got Belgians, Swiss, Maltese, uh, Dutch, um, Portuguese, uh, Italians, um, me as the Brit, and uh, a token American uh, as well. Um, so this is the, the team that did the, the bottom dives. We had some support divers as well. And this is a great location because we took this picture outside the dive center. So just over there, out of shot, is the dive center. Immediately behind us is the harbor where we used to dive. And um, when the pho photographer turns around and takes the shot behind him, this is the exit of the harbor in Kia. And the Britannic is just there. Okay, just outside the uh, the harbour, uh, and then this is the um, the harbour that we were using, and the boat. You can see, you know, nothing special. It's not a multi-million pound expedition vessel, um, standard technical diving boat. That's us on the uh, uh, on the boat, um, and um, that's Yanni, the owner of Kia Divers, on the right hand side, uh, who was fantastic and gave us a lot of support. But one thing he couldn't give us was any technical diving equipment. Because there were very few people diving uh, between 2009 and 2016, Kia divers were, at that point were set up as a, just a recreational diving uh, center. They had single cylinders, they could do air, and that was about it. So part of the expedition involved shipping all of our stuff to, uh, to Greece. Sil bailout cylinders, uh, getting the oxygen, the helium delivered, booster pumps, deco trapezes, rebreathers, uh, everything. Um, so this is it arriving in a, a number of pallets after being shipped there uh, and in the dive center and then loading up. And we had to load up everything every single uh, day. So we had a very strict procedure to make sure that all the gas was analyzed and marked up and only known gas went on the, the boat. Um, that particularly relevant for me because that was one of the contributing factors uh, to Carl's death on the Britannic in 2009. And I want to make sure we uh, we learned the lessons uh, from all of that. So this was our um, blending center. So um, all of this we brought with us. Actually, no, that that um, Yanni provided the the cylinder to bright to to drive the booster pumps, but we arranged for the O2 and the helium to be. Uh, delivered with uh, a booster pump here and then there's another one just around the corner there and that was my job I was in uh, I was in charge of all the blending uh, it was a great team everyone had their their role uh, one person was in charge of the overall expedition another one was in charge of getting all the equipment from the dive center to the boat someone else was in charge of overall safety um, I was in charge of blending um, and then someone else made the arrangements for dinner uh, so that once we'd finished blending for the next day, we didn't have to 
hunt around for a uh, uh, somewhere to eat. Um, so uh, yeah, there's me uh, pumping the cylinders, and even though I was in charge of all of it, there was a, a group of us that did the, the filling every day. Okay, so dive in the Britannic. Um, the Britannic is quite a challenging wreck to dive for a number of reasons. The depth, partly, it's 120 to the bottom, but 85 to the to the top, and the midline is about the sort of 90. Uh, 1995 meter range so you don't have to go below 100 meters to dive the the Britannic because it's on its side you can do a you know a great dive on the midline um, but you can see you've got Kia here and the mainland here and um, the mainland is very mountainous so Kia is a very mountainous island it's not a flat island it's very mountainous so what happens is the wind gets funneled down between through this strait and um, it's, it's apparently it's one of the windiest places in Greece, which creates issues for the sea conditions, but also sets up huge currents. You don't have um, tidal currents, but there's a, a strong current um, with the wind, so it gets very, very, uh, very, very windy and a strong current. In addition, the reason the Britannic was going up here is that it's the main route up into uh, the um, the Dardanelles and through into the Black Sea. So it's one of the busiest uh, shipping uh, areas in the world. So there's a constant stream of very big vessels going up and down here. So again, one of the other reasons why you need permission to dive it is that the Greek Coast Guard has got to close down part of this and, and get all the traffic on this side uh, when you're diving. Um, and, and then, you know, depending on the current, you might end up running down there. Um, so it's all back to the shot line and up a deco trapeze and then a releasable deco trapeze so we can float with the current because um, you wouldn't be able to hold on to the uh, the deco bar in that sort of current. So that's a picture of us going down the um, uh, going down the line and this next slide is hopefully all no play. This is just to show you the um, the deco setup. So you've got deco line here. There's a gas staged on the line down here. Uh, and then you've got the deco trapeze up there with gas staged on that as well. Um, and then we had um, safety divers in the water who could bring in additional gas, take off cylinders. Uh, we also had a chase boat. So if anybody came off um, and couldn't get back to the line, uh, came off there at a chase boat with another safety diver who could drop in with full uh, sets of uh, of gas. Um, we also used a uh, a team approach where everyone was split into was split into two teams. The first team went down, and then the second team went in about thirty minutes later. So they're coming down as the first team is starting to come back up the the line. So they can in, in effect act as safety divers, deep safety divers. We would pass them usually around about the sixty meter mark on the way down, uh, uh, way down the um, the line. So if there's a problem, abort and and support the other divers coming back up. Um, and then uh, we'd go down, second team would be doing the, the dive, come back up, and because of the length of deco we were doing, everybody ended up concertinaing on the line, so there was sort of overlap. So if they, again, if there was a problem, the second team could then help the, uh, the first team. <clears throat> and um, as I said, you, you don't have to do 120 meters, you don't have to go down to the seabed, but of course I did. Um, you can see, you know, that's the top of the wreck there. That's the midway point. I spent quite a lot of time there. And then just dropped down. Uh, and that was right in the very bow. The bow, it's, it's sort of lying like that. And the point of the bow goes, is in the sand at about 120 meters. So there was no way I was going to miss the opportunity to go right to the very bow and have a look at that. And then in terms of the, the run times, um, so we were doing about 30 minute run time uh, at yeah, most of the time we're averaging 100 meters, um, and then yeah, an hour or two of deco um, on the way up. Um, interesting, you know, we were talking about gradient factor, uh, gradient factors yesterday. Um, 
we, everybody uh, had to use the same gases and within a team, everybody used the same grading factors, but there were different grading factors between teams. Um, I was running 5080, um, even back in 2016, I was still running 5080. Um, and my run time for that dive was 246 minutes. Some divers were running 2070 uh, and they were doing a 303 minute run time. Same bottom time, but an hour's difference on the, uh, on the deco. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of uh, times that we were doing. And then the state of the wreck, that's a side, sa side scan sonar of the wreck. Um, so this is the bow up here with the bow right in the sand. Got the bridge area here, the superstructure and the props down there. And you can see there's this very clear break uh, here, um, which is partly where the mine hit, but also when it sank, the, uh, the stern was still out of the water when the bow hit and there was a, um, a, a break. So there's a, a very clear break in that area here. Um, other than that, it looks almost uh, intact, but it does mean that's a, a um, you know, it's very, it's very easy to see into the wreck on the various levels in the, in the break. There's a, an artist's impression, um, which is, uh, it's, it's very accurate. That is exactly how I remember it. Uh, you've got the bridge area here, again, the break, um, even the color with all the coral on it, uh, that is pretty much the color. I put this on uh, Facebook as we were diving the, the wreck, and uh, one of the comments I got was, oh, wow, that's a fantastic uh, photograph. How did they take that photograph? No, no, it's, it's, it's not a photograph. It's, a, it's an artist's impression. Um, because it's so big, you know, it's impossible to take a picture that really shows the, uh, the, the scale of it. Um, so there's another artist's impression showing the stern. And again, you can see the props are very clear. They're up proud of the, um, uh, up, up proud, proud of the seabed. Uh, still, lots of the superstructure uh, is very accessible from another area. And on this one, you can see it's the, these lifeboat davits are pretty uh, exaggerated on here. Uh, but it's a useful point of reference because... Uh, there's the actual picture, and you can see there's those same lifeboat davits, so that's about about this area here. Um, and that's, uh, that's where our shot line was, midships, so we could go front or back. Everybody, all, all but two um, divers were using scooters, uh, and with scooters you could do the whole length. Um, without scooters there's no way you could get to either the bow or the, the stern, and certainly not uh, the whole of it in one dive. Um, so yeah, that's the um, uh, that's on the port side as you're dropping down. I think our shot line. Yeah, I can see it on mine in the in the background. It's just uh, coming uh, across there. Um, uh, and so this is the promenade deck in in here, and it was really useful because I think you can see it on which one. Yeah, here you can see the promenade deck. Um, the windows change at this point here. So if you're coming back along here inside the promenade deck, you can tell when the windows change, you know that if you pop up there, the shot line was immediately behind you. Um, so yeah, that's showing some of the, the corals on it. Um, that's an attempt to, to show just the size and the scale of, uh, of this thing. So that's about probably at about 100 meters looking up at half the wreck uh, above us. Um, that's in that promenade deck that I was telling you about. So actually I should just move this picture around because um, it's on its side. That would have been the windows looking out to see. That's the deck, that's the floor, uh, sorry, that's the ceiling. Uh, and these are the windows of the doors into the, uh, the rooms on, on either side. Just up there is the Marconi radio room, the equivalent on the Britannic to where the, um, uh, the, the SOS was sent from, from Titanic. And um, uh, this, I think Adam mentioned it the other day about uh, the Saratoga being like the, the Death Star. Um, this really felt like the Death Star. We would be scootering along here and then up and, and out just before we got to the, uh, the shot line. And then looking in, in here, Every one of these doors, there was just amazing stuff inside every one of the, um, the rooms. Um, 
there's, there's a couple of plaques there that we put down as part of the 100 year um, commemoration. We put down a, a, a plaque uh, commemorating uh, the wreck, but also the second plaque uh, was funded by the people of Kia uh, to commemorate Carl Spencer. They have got a lot of affection for Carl in Kia because he popularized diving the, the Britannic and brought, you know, brought a lot of tourism to the Britannic or to the island. Okay, so yeah, lots of bailout and scooters. Um, uh, again, that's me. Um, and again, trying to get a an impression of the, the scale. I think the only pictures that do a even halfway good job of giving the scale is this one. So this is taken from the bow. These are the anchor chains coming down. Um, you can see the, the railings on the bow are still intact. Um, and then the brake would be just back here. And this is the bridge area up here. Okay, so also gives you an idea of the visibility. To be able to see that far uh, is uh, it's pretty amazing. Sorry? <clears throat> yeah, you don't need to come all the way here. Mediterranean's got fantastic visibility. Um, and that's just a little bit closer up in the break, I think. Um, uh, yeah, there. He's looking down into the break, and then you can see diver up there for scale. And this is the bridge up, uh, up here. And then again, uh, this is swimming back along the superstructure, and it's just like a, like a block of flats next to you. And the props on the Britannic are just uh, amazing, absolutely stunning. Uh, so this is the top one, which is about, yeah, about eight, 85, 90. Um, and then you've got the middle one around about um, 100. And then the, the bottom one, which is a bit lower at, uh, at 110. And they are just uh, huge. You can sort of see the scale in there, but I think that picture um, really shows the scale so this is the top prop then you've got the middle one in here and then there's another one underneath uh, and that's the the rudder there just awesome size um, and as i said you know there's lots of things uh, in there uh, lots to look at if you go in the bridge at the back of the bridge you've got the captain's uh, stateroom and the captain's bathroom and um, the the bath actually is is quite a an important part of the story because when the Britannic hit the mine, the captain was apparently in the bath, um, jumped out, put his bathrobe on, and conducted the whole operation in his bathrobe, and was still in his bathrobe when he uh, evacuated the, the ship. So, you know, it started with him in the bath, and 100 years later, it's still full of water. <laughs> uh, so this is a, uh, another plaque that was, was already on the wreck. Uh, so this is a plaque commemorating Cousteau finding it, and this was put on by uh, Kevin Gurr. Now, there's, there's two stories about this, this plaque, two funny stories. The first, um, which I know is absolute, well, I know both of them are true. Um, the first one is from Kevin Gurr himself, and he got this plaque cast, and it's a big brass plaque. It's probably, it's this sort of size. And um, he strapped it to his twin set, because uh, they were diving twin sets in those days, jumped in, and if you've got a lump of brass that sort of size, what's that going to do to your weighting? Um, he jumped in, and boom, and he said he was plummeting down. He couldn't stop himself. He thought he was going to put a hole in the Britannic where he hit it, um, managed to you know, not um, land in a, in a splat on the Britannic, but, and then deployed it. So this has been on the Britannic since about, um, since two. 1997. So we're diving it in October 2016. And um, uh, the f I'd been invited to speak at Eurotech and I couldn't because I was going to be diving the Protonic instead. I thought that was a pretty good uh, alternative. Um, so on the, the Tuesday or the Wednesday or whatever it was, we put this, po this picture on Facebook of, you know, this is the plaque on the, on the Britannic. Now, unknown to Kev, the factory had made a spare. So there was a second one of these. And it, he didn't know about it. It moved around. It got sold. Uh, and then Dean Martin, who used to work for Apex, now works for Fourth Element, bought this plaque at auction. 
he just you know, said um, Cousteau Titanic plaque. He didn't know what it was, bought it, I think it was an eBay auction or something, um, without knowing exactly what, what it was. And then when he got it, he realized, wow, this is something uh, special. Um, so he took it to Eurotech about four days after we'd taken this picture. Um, and this rumor went around Eurotech that we'd lifted this off the Britannic and brought it back. Like, no, no, we're still out here. We'll go back tomorrow and take another picture to show it's still there. Um, so Dean's got this, um, uh, got this plaque, um, which is a, an exact replica of that. And what he's done now, he's got everyone he knows that has dived the Britannic to sign the, uh, the back. Um, and again, because of Carl Spencer's death on the, uh, uh, the Britannic, what he's also done is he's got a copy of Carl's um, signature from his wife and laser engraved it on the back of the, the plaque, and that's now in the Explorers Club in, uh, in New York. Okay, so um, as I said, photos don't really do, the, um, do it justice, the scale of it. Um, so what we've got now is a, uh, a video. Um, everyone on the expedition had some sort of video, even if it was just a GoPro stuck to the front of their, their scooter. Um, so this, is, this next clip is um, some footage I took. It's literally just stuck on the end of my scooter. I'm just zipping around and letting it film as we, we go along. Um, so what you're gonna see is starting up, off up here and we scooter back along here and actually I've cut a little bit of it as we go along um, because actually it just gets a bit boring. It's just acres and acres of, of, of deck here and superstructure. Um, and then, um, yeah, then we come down here underneath and then I come up past one prop. It's a little bit cloudy down here. Uh, nothing that you guys aren't used to. A um, little bit cloudy down here, and then come up through the, the rudder and the second prop, up to the, uh, the third prop, along the prop shaft, back over, um, over the hull, and then back through this uh, hatch, this area here, into the, um, into the promenade deck, back towards the, uh, the shot line. So, so this plays. Okay, so you can see covered in this um, uh, marine life. And this is, uh, I've got no video lights on this. This is literally just a, a GoPro on the front. Uh, the only lights that we've got are our own handheld torches. So this is about midships. See, there's quite a lot of nets. Um, it's supposed to be a, an exclusion zone and the, the fishermen are not supposed to fish near it, but there are quite a lot of nets on it. So in a minute, we're going to drop down. Uh, so yeah, we're near the stern here. We're going to drop down uh, under the prop. So that's the bottom prop, and you see it's fairly murky down there. And then the rudders here, it's the second middle prop. So I'm now scootering directly up. And 
That's the third one. So now we're coming from the pops up round the, the hull. Uh, and this is the bit I think also gives it the size, size of the scale because we're just scootering and scootering and scootering. Ooh. Come on. Yeah. So well, I will just play the video directly. <coughs> So we're coming up over the hull. <clears throat> and then you can see the sort, the superstructure just there. So we're going to go in there along the promenade deck. So technically this is open, so this isn't rec penetration. Our, um, our permission from the government didn't allow any penetration. Um, so that's why this bit, this is the only bit you'll see where we're inside because we're not actually inside because it's open above us. And there's all these doorways here and you can look into pretty much any hole and there's something interesting in there. I think in a minute I'm going to just stick the camera in a random hole. There's a sink here with plates in it, and there's tiles on the floor. And then up and back to the shot line and three hours of deco. So that's the Britannic. Um, as I said, you know, truck, bikini, and the Britannic were all on my um, uh, on my bucket list, and. You know, if you put everything together, I think they're all 
pretty comparable. In terms of an, one individual wreck, uh, the Britannic is still my favourite wreck by, uh, by a long way. Um, as I said, we, um, on that trip, we weren't allowed to go uh, inside it, uh, but you know, you could, we dived it for 10 days um, and still didn't see all of the outside of it. Um, the, we were extremely lucky because it's so windy, most people, they, they might get one dive uh, on an entire dive trip. Um, we were told, you know, book 10 days and expect to dive one or two days. The weather for us was perfect. We dived it on the first day, and Yanni, the dive center owner, said, you know, you guys are so lucky. We get about 10 days a year like this, and you've had one of them. And the next day, we had another one, and another one, and another one. Um, I think on um, two of the days, it was a bit windy. So on one, one day, we decided we should have a day off, as we've been doing back-to-back 100-meter -back dives. Uh, and on the other one, we dived the Verdigalia, which is the other wreck in the area. Uh, but yeah, we basically, if we pushed it, we could have dived every single day, which is pretty much unheard of. We did more dives and took more photographs and more video on that expedition than, than any of the others uh, before. And very successful because zero bend rate as well. So that's the Britannic. If you get a chance to dive it, I would definitely recommend it. You want a little plug on where you are, what are you doing? So, yeah, um, the Britannic was one of my bucket uh, list dives, and I'm currently in my, one of my others. We're in uh, Bikini Atoll with the Dirty Dozen, um, ticking off the last of my top three uh, bucket lists. Um, but as with the Britannic, I want to go back. Same thing with Bikini Atoll. I'm definitely going to come back. I'm going to be coming back here in 2025. So go onto the Dirty Dozen website and book on and come back with me.